This is the 14th lecture of the semester, and we'll be covering signal transduction, uh, the beginning of our, our segment on sig signal transduction in this lecture. Uh, the next three lectures will all be covering various aspects of signal transduction. And this is from chapter 12 in the text. And really, it, it, we, we try to give a, a good overview of the different, some of the different major pathways in signal transduction. And we'll um, show some specific examples of uh, a couple important types of, of signaling molecules. Okay, and today what we're going to be covering um, is one, just kind of some general features of, of cellular signaling in, in general. And there are five really general features um, that are very important in, in all signaling pathways that we'll, we'll, we'll focus on. Okay, and that comes from the first section of the chapter. Okay, then we'll, we'll move on to section two. And these are the G protein coupled receptors or GPCRs. Um, this is an important class of, of receptors uh, and signaling pathways. And the specific example we'll see in this section is the beta 2 adrenergic receptor uh, or epinephrine receptor uh, or uh, ad adrenaline receptor. Okay. And then we'll skip ahead to section 10 and talk about the pathway, signaling pathway involved in sight. And that also involves another G protein coupled receptor uh, that we've mentioned before, uh, and that is rhodopsin. Okay. And rhodopsin is the, the G protein coupled receptor. And then this is coupled to uh, some ion channels and, and, and we'll be covering that next time is uh, a little bit more in detail of the ligand gated ion channels. Okay. So some biochemical roles of signal transduction are given here on this slide. Okay. And there's you know a number of different uh, molecules that uh, in the body that can be used to for signaling um, antigens that that lets you your body know your immune system know that there's something that needs to be uh, attacked or removed that's foreign. Okay, you can have hormones uh, that sort of act throughout the body, um, neurotransmitters that act specifically in, in nerve cells. Um, there's also things like physical things like light that uh, elicits a, a response in your body to actually view it. Uh, touch is another um, signaling pathway. You, you physically touch something and a signal gets transduced from, you know, let's say your hand all the way into your brain that you can, you can feel that. And, and also pheromones. Right. The signals cause changes in, in either the cell's composition or the cell's function. Okay. And some examples are, are shown here uh, of that. There are thousands of signals uh, either you know outside in the environment or also uh, with, within our body, okay? But only approximately 10 different receptor types or patterns have been, have been found, okay? So you can see that um, there's there's kind of a limited number of, of receptor motifs, if you will, that are used to detect many, many signals. A list of some of the important receptor types are shown here, and this is given by the book. Um, G protein coupled receptors, uh, and first I should mention, receptors, when we're talking about receptors, we're gonna be focusing on membrane bound receptors. That's why this chapter is sort of right after our discussion of membranes. But there technically are some soluble proteins that are, um, that are re considered receptors. Um, but we're gonna be focusing on the membrane bound ones. Okay, and when a receptor binds a, a molecule, what we refer to the molecule that it's binding is its ligand, okay, 
when it binds, the receptor binds its ligand, it's going to exert some sort of a physiological effect. That's also known as an intrinsic effect. And the types that we're going to be focusing on in this class, one are the G protein coupled receptors. And we'll see a couple examples of those. Again, one is the epinephrine receptor or beta 2 adrenergic receptor. And the other one will be rhodopsin. Okay. We'll also look at uh, receptors known as enzyme linked uh, receptors or um, uh, tyrosine kinase receptors. Okay. Um, those we're, we're going to be focusing on next lecture. Okay. Some of the specific examples that we'll see one is the insulin receptor and um, uh, epidermal growth factor receptor. And then also something known as cyclin CDK. Um, cyclin CDK is, is a little bit different because it's not a membrane bound receptor, um, but it's involved in, in cell cycle regulation. All right. Next lecture, we'll also be talking a little bit about ligand gated ion channels and, and specifically um, the sodium channel. Uh, it says potassium here. Um, but we'll, we'll be talking about the sodium channel specifically next time and um, something known as the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And both of those are involved in, in um, nerve signaling. Okay. These are shown in gray because this slide is from a previous class that I did where we didn't cover these. But in this class, there will also be um, the third lecture in this uh, signaling series will be a very short lecture and we'll be talking about uh, a little bit about integrin receptors and, and some nuclear receptors as well. Okay. So here's a list of the five features of all signal transducing systems. Um, this is figure 12.1 in the book and we're going to be going through these uh, uh, sort of step by step uh, and give some examples of each. Okay, so the first one would be specificity. And receptors are very specific for the, the signaling molecules that they bind. Okay, so there's really, you know, primarily, if you're a, a good receptor, there's, you know, one signaling molecule that will bind or one type of signaling molecule that will bind. And other molecules that don't have that correct shape can't bind in that receptor and they can't elicit that that response. Okay. Uh, some typical ligands for receptors are things like small ions. Um, the a, a example it would be in bacteria. There's a, an iron receptor. Okay. Um, organic molecules. These you see a lot uh, in in humans. And we'll be talking about the the adrenaline or epinephrine in, in the beta adrenergic receptor here shortly. It would be an example of an organic molecule as a, a signaling molecule or ligand for a receptor. Uh, polysaccharides, so those are, are um, multiple sugar molecules attached in a chain. Uh, peptides, uh, small small sequences of amino acids are, are called peptides. They can be um, uh, signaling molecules. And an example there would be insulin. And then proteins themselves, uh, and those are things like gr growth factors, are, are usually larger proteins can be signaling molecules. Okay. Uh, the second um, feature of, of signaling transducing pathways uh, would be uh, amplification. And you can also think of this as, as being a, a ca cascade. Okay. So a signaling molecule will you know, bind a single receptor. Okay, that receptor generally will activate uh, multiple um, copies of a second enzyme or protein okay so it, it will activate in this case and our receptor would be enzyme one 
uh, getting that signaling molecule, a binding of that signaling molecule, then it will activate um, an, a second enzyme. And in this case, it activates three of them in this example. And then en enzyme two then will activate three more uh, of enzyme three. So you can see that one signaling molecule can now have acti activating um, nine enzyme threes, okay? Um, so this is kind of a generic example, and we'll see, we'll see a, um, a more specific example of this uh, in, a, in a minute. Okay, the third feature, uh, modularity. Okay. It turns out that, that um, proteins can have, um, can form complexes with each other, these um, signaling proteins, and they can make um, really different different complexes that can have different activities. So you'll see the same uh, building block proteins in different pathways, and, and that's a, an example of of sort of you can think of it as is. Um, trying to think of a good example um, and nothing's coming to the to the top of my head right now um, but if you have uh, something that can be used in multiple ways uh, that I guess that would be the the closest example that I can come to right now okay and and phosphorylation is these proteins being phosphorylated is is a good um, point of interaction for for these complexes. I don't know if we actually see very many specific examples of modularity uh, in this class in the pathways we look at. Um, I don't recall any at, at, off the top of my head. But if you think about it, um, if you if you have thousands of different signals and you only have 10 different types of, of, of receptor um, available, some of the secondary signaling from those receptors, it, it would help out immensely if you can use the same protein in different pathways and in different uh, complexes. Okay. okay, the fourth feature it would be um, what's known as desensitization, desensitization, excuse me, or adaptation. Okay, and this is where you have a signal uh, that activates a receptor. Then you know you have some sort of a a response from that receptor from that signal. Um, that response at the end, once you once you have enough of that response, it feeds back and it shuts off that receptor. Okay. So you can think of this as uh, feedback. Okay. Uh, and then finally, the fifth feature would be what's known as integration. And In integration, this can get really kind of complex. Um, we'll see some, some sort of, some examples of this um, as we go through this class today. Uh, it, it can get really complex. Uh, and we will try not to get uh, too complex with this, at least in our class. Okay, integration is when you can have two or more signals um, with opposite effects. Okay, so in this example here, we have signal one uh, going to receptor one and signal two going to receptor two, and they do, they signals cause the opposite effect. So in, in this case, the concentration of X goes up or the membrane potential is going up. For receptor two, the concentration of X goes down or the membrane potential goes down. The net effect of these two is, um, the, the net effect is the interplay between those two, okay? And this is also referred to as crosstalk. So if you have two different receptors and two different pathways that sort of combine um, or converge on the same physiological 
response and maybe they have opposite effects or they might even have a similar effect right the the net response of that cell is going to be the the sum from both of the those receptors or you know however many receptors are acting on on whatever that physiological response is okay and again that is that is referred to also as crosstalk okay so here are six different types of signaling that that can occur through a membrane okay, okay. Number one, and this is the, the first example we'll see are, are G protein coupled receptors. Um, the, in these, you have a ligand that binds to your receptor. Uh, and I should mention too, before I get too far ahead of myself, you know, one through five of these uh, are all involving membrane bound receptors. Okay. Number six, nuclear receptors, those are the ones that, that aren't membrane bound. Okay. So back to G uh, proteins or G protein coupled receptors. Okay. You have that ligand binding the receptor that activates a G protein. That's why they're called uh, G coupled or G protein coupled receptors. Okay. That then will then either activate another enzyme or inactivate another enzyme depending on um, the, the pathway. All right. Uh, so those are the ones we'll be covering today. Receptor tyrosine kinases, and, and we'll talk about the structure in the next lecture a little bit, but they, they are, um, integral membrane proteins that have very large regions inside and outside the cell. When they bind their ligand, they, uh, activate the intercellular part that then, um, phosphorylates uh, other, another protein, and then that protein phosphorylates another protein, and you get what's known as a kinase cascade. Kinase is a, a word for a protein that phosphorylates something. Okay. Uh, three, the uh, receptor guanonyl cyclase, and we won't really see, I don't think we see examples of this specifically in this class, but it, it binds a ligand and it turns GTP into cyclic GMP. Uh, we'll see something very similar here in a minute with uh, ATP to cyclic AMP. Uh, four gated ion channels. These are ion channels that are, um, in general, they're closed when they don't have a ligand bound. The ligand will bind and then that opens the channel and allows ions to go through. Uh, adhesion receptors or integrins okay these are a little bit um, a little a little bit different uh, thus they're they're binding um, their receptor or excuse me their their ligand is, is can be very large um, extracellular um, uh, uh, matrix okay and that changes a conformation and that that change in conformation is transduced through the membrane into the cytoskeleton. Okay. And then finally, um, nuclear receptors, you have a ligand that, that it's acting not on anything in the membrane, but, uh, on a receptor that's in the nucleus. Okay. And then that either, um, in general, it, 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 well, it can either express uh, a gene or it can, can block the expression of a gene. Okay. And I should mention too that the, the tyrosine kinases, their, their kinase cascade eventually acts on a, a, um, an activator or a repressor of a gene within the nucleus. So moving on to section two, and, and these are the G protein coupled receptors. Um, they're alpha helical and they uh, have seven transmembrane helices. Okay, and that's, uh, we've, we've already talked about one of these even though we, we didn't mention that it was a G protein coupled receptor. Uh, and that was rhodopsin, and we'll see that that 
that again today, but that was the, the protein that had seven transmembrane helices. Okay, that's a, a very widely studied G protein coupled receptor. And that's shown here in red. Okay, so those are the seven transmembrane helices. Okay, and this part here, this is the, 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 the G protein coupled receptor, that's in red. That is the part that's in the membrane, and, it, and for the most part, it, it does span the entire membrane. Okay. The other part of G-protein coupled receptor pathways, you have the receptor part, but then you have the G-protein as well. And that's shown here in the, the three different colors. Okay. Those G-proteins are membrane-associated proteins. They're not integral membrane proteins. You, you would really consider them uh, peripheral membrane proteins. Uh, um, they have a very small uh, anchor that keeps them associated with the membrane. And they have, um, well, they, most of them, the, the examples that we'll see are heterotrimeric, meaning they have three separate polypeptide chains that are all different in sequence. And they're, they're, those subunits are denoted alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay, some G proteins can be single chains. Um, those, those typically are much smaller. Uh, okay, so, you know, here we see this. The G protein is actually, you know, larger than the receptor part. Okay. Okay, the G proteins are um, also, they the reason they're called G proteins is that they, they bind GTP and that's very important for their, their um, activity, which we'll mention here shortly. Uh, the G proteins uh, mediate this signal transduction from the receptor to other target proteins. So they're, they're sort of like a, um, a middleman, if you will. This is a cartoon depiction of a G protein. And, and I'm gonna say a few words about their, the, the actual um, mechanism, I guess, if you will, of the G protein. Uh, they have two, the, so this, the cartoony blob here is the protein. Um, and these are sort of the, 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 localized um, domains of this protein. There's, there's a switch one and a switch two on either side of what's known as the P loop. Okay, and the, the P loop, I'm guessing that stands for phosphate loop. Um, not exactly sure, but that is the region where the, the triphosphate moiety of the 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 GTP sits okay and then in the switches and switch one you have uh, three anine at position 35 that is um, hydrogen bound to that uh, an oxygen in, in that that gamma phosphate group and in switch two it's it's glycine at position 60 okay the the G protein is is active uh, when it has GTP bound, and it's inactive when it has GDP bound. Okay, and the the reason why these things don't just bind GTP and then stay active forever is that they actually have uh, an enzymatic activity in them, and that is uh, for the cleavage of that terminal phosphate group. Okay, so a G protein actually ha will will catalyze the the cleavage of that that phosphate group in the in the GTP, which then inactivates it. Okay, which is you know you might think that's kind of odd too. You know these things are are waiting for their receptor to bind something, then to activate them, just to to cut that off and inactivate themselves. But that really provides a time limit on how long they're active. Okay, you, you don't really want something to be active forever, like 
just keep producing that same signal, even uh, or that same response, even though the signal has gone away. Okay, so that's one way in, in which these, the, these G proteins turn themselves off. This is a crystal structure of, of uh, one of the more um, widely known G proteins, and that's ROS. We'll, we'll see more examples of that um, later uh, in, in other lectures. Okay, um, and this is, you don't need to know any of this, but here, here's what it looks like in, in sort of real life as opposed to a cartoon. We have uh, switch one here in red, uh, P loop, and then this is switch two. Okay, so you have these, um, some binding between um, switch one and switch two in that, that terminal phosphate group. So here are a few um, crystal structures of, of different uh, G um, protein coupled receptors. They are um, just their positions in the membrane here are shown. Okay, so they they span the entire membrane. There's a extracellular part and an intracellular part. Okay, the extracellular part is where the that ligand is going to bind the ligand binding site and then the the inside part is where it's going to be interacting with the g protein so here is the the beta 2 adrenergic receptor and this was the one we're going to we're going to talk um, in more detail about okay there's also um, uh, op opioid receptors are like this um, histamine receptors are also um, g protein coupled receptors uh, the G protein here is shown um, G sub S alpha, G sub S sub beta, uh, sub beta and G sub S uh, gamma. If you see the G sub S, that S stands for, um, um, oh geez, I just had it. <laughs> uh, stimulate. Um, stimulating that doesn't sound right but it, it's i think that's it 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 means that they they go on to activate something else uh in there the other type of um g proteins that you see would be inhibitory and we'll see an example of, of one of those So epinephrine, epinephrine, or also known as adrenaline, is a hormone made in adrenal glands. Okay, and those are uh, organs on top of the kidneys. Okay, what epinephrine does is it me uh, mediates a stress response. And you've, you've probably heard of the, the flight or f uh, fight response. And what that does, what this molecule does it, it's a little bit of it, it it's tissue specific but what it's doing is it's it's going to be mobilizing energy sources so that you can use them to either fight fight off something or run away really quickly from some danger in muscle or liver cells this hormone epinephrine it induces the breakdown of glycogen into glucose, right? So it, it releases a bunch of glucose. That glucose then can be used, you know, in your muscle cells to, to run away really fast or, or to fight something off. Um, in fat tissue, adipose cells, uh, it induces lipid hydrolysis, which again gets um, free fatty acids uh, available to be metabolized. In, in heart cells, it increases heart rate to, to speed up blood flow, to get those, those metabolites to different tissues, to get oxygen to, to your muscles quicker when you're, when you're running away from something. And what epinephrine looks like, uh, the structure is shown here. It's a relatively small molecule, um, sort of a benzene ring with two... Uh, OH groups, two hydroxyls, and then we have a, a four-member chain 
uh, on the other side of this benzene ring. Okay, and that, you know, there's one alcohol group, um, an amine group in there uh, in that part of that chain. So nothing like, I guess, nothing that really stands, stands out drastically, um, but it does have a very specific shape. Um, and it fits in that receptor, you know, very well. And the KD value shown here, it's five micromolar. Um, there are synthetic molecules that, that you can make as, as drugs. One of them is shown here. You don't need to know that structure um, or the name of it, really. Uh, what's important to note is that this is an agonist. And what agonist means is it's a molecule that binds in a, a receptor and it gives the same response as the, the natural ligand. Okay. So this, this turns on that receptor just like epinephrine would turn that receptor on. The difference is if you look at the KD, um, this synthetic agonist has a much smaller KD, so it actually binds in there um, uh, more tightly. Okay. So you can you can design drugs that, that work better than the natural ligands, at least um, that bind better than the natural ligands. Okay. The other drug shown down here is what's known as an antagonist. An antagonist, uh, you can also think of it as, as an inhibitor. It will bind in a receptor, but it, it blocks the the natural response of, of whatever that receptor does. Okay, so this is an example of something that would bind and, and inhibit or, or block that signaling pathway. Okay. And that KD value is much, much lower than the, the KD value of the natural ligand. So that, there's another example of how you can um, purposely design something that fits even better than the natural ligand or um, I shouldn't say fits better necessarily, but it, it, it stays in that, that binding pocket um, longer. It, it's held tighter. Okay, let's look at this uh, beta adrenergic receptor pathway in some more detail. Okay, and the beta adrenergic receptor, okay, that's, that's another name for the, the epinephrine uh, receptor. Okay. So th that can be a little bit confusing. Um, adrenaline, epinephrine, and beta adrenergic receptor, we're all talking about the same, same thing. Okay. And I should mention here too that we're, now that we're covering these, these signaling pathways, it, it can get a little bit complex because this is really our first um, look at, at pathways, uh, true, true pathways. And the thing about pathways that's a little bit, can be a little bit tricky for some people, um, me included, is that they really do require some memorization. Um, they're pr pretty much all memorization. When you're when you're going through a pathway, um, it's it's sort of um, where biology comes into play now. So I will um, try to highlight some of the the important features of these. We'll go through it. Um, hopefully that helps you to remember them a little bit. Um, but you probably do need to read through the book and and look at these these figures in some detail to remember them and even even writing them out helps a lot like on, on note cards or something. Um, I'm probably wouldn't now if this was, um, you know, kind of a, a normal class and not online lectures. Um, I, I could ask you to, to draw a pathway from scratch. But in, in general, um, I try to stay away from those types of questions, um, but they would be sort of fair game. On an online exam, I'm probably not gonna ask you to, to recreate a, an entire signaling pathway, um, but explaining different steps or, or picking out um, 
examples of the five features of of all signaling transducing pathways in in these um, would be kind of fair game okay so there's there's my spiel so let's look at this one in a little bit more detail so first the first thing that happens as you would expect um, is that your your ligand is going to bind to the receptor so in this case the beta adrenergic receptor binds epinephrine so epinephrine here shown in this little cartoony um, kind of brown color goes into the receptor the beta adrenergic receptor and binds okay so this is our, our G uh, protein coupled receptor. Um, it is seven transmembrane helices, the binding pockets on the outside of the cell. Okay, that, that epinephrine binds. Okay, what that does is it causes the, the, um, the GDP that's bound in our alpha subunit, GS alpha, uh, to be released. So that binds, uh, G alpha will release GDP and it will bind GTP. Okay, when it does that, it separates from the beta and gamma subunits of the G protein, and then it becomes more mobile and it can move around. Okay, in the case of the, the beta adrenergic receptor, that G protein is going to to move until it finds the target, its target enzyme, known as adenylyl cyclase. Okay. This active G alpha um, subunit, when it has GDP, will then activate adenylyl cyclase, bind to it and activate it. Adenylyl cyclase then will take ATP and convert it to cyclic AMP. And we'll, we'll see that molecule in detail here in a second. Okay, cyclic AMP is then a, a uh, sort of a secondary messenger, if you will. It will then go to activate a protein known as PKA. Um, you can think of that as standing for protein kinase A. And remember what a kinase is, a kinase is a, an enzyme that phosphorylates other proteins. So PKA then phosphorylates other proteins, and it, it actually has lots of different targets that it can phosphorylate. Okay, and so those other proteins that get phosphorylated then go on to give the cellular response to epinephrine. Okay. Um, the, the last step here is that cyclic AMP is then degraded and then it, it, that reverses the activation of, of PKA. And we'll look at in, in these, some of these steps in a little bit more detail here. Okay, this is um, crystal structures of the, this, this receptor system um, and uh, modeled in a, a molecular dynamic simulation with with membrane molecules around them just to show you uh, maybe a little bit more how this looks in, um, in in all actuality not just a cartoon picture okay but again you don't really need to know any of these right this obviously wouldn't show up on an exam just a, a better idea of, of more a realistic picture of this. So cyclic AMP is a pretty interesting molecule. Uh, it's made from ATP and that adenylyl cyclase enzyme cuts off the, the, the um, two phosphate groups uh, and, and leaves an AMP, but it also catalyzes the formation of a bond between um, this first phosphate, um, the alpha phosphate, and the um, OH group on this ribose sugar in, in the um, ATP uh, to make a, a cyclic structure. Okay, And so the cyclic structure, that phosphate, is going to be bound to um, the oxygen on the 3' oxygen and the 5' oxygen. 
Okay, so that's cyclic AMP. We haven't talked about sugar structure, carbohydrate structures yet, so I, I wouldn't expect you to, um, to draw this molecule right now. Um, we'll be talking about uh, carbohydrate structure in Chapter 7. So um, for now, I, I would kind of expect you, if I showed you a picture, you should be able to recognize this because it has this very weird... Um, cyclic structure with a phosphate. Okay. Um, this stays active until a, another enzyme known as um, a, a nucleotide phosphodiesterase uh, cuts that, that bond here at the three prime and, and then that gives five prime AMP. Cyclic AMP um, is a secondary messenger, as we mentioned. Um, it, it allosterically activates uh, a, a protein known as CMP-dependent protein kinase A, which is abbreviated as PKA. So you can think of that as protein kinase A. Okay. Protein kinase A then leads to the activation of, of many other enzymes. Um, most of the goal... Um, from that activation goes to produce glucose from glycogen, but it, there, there are other, depending on the tissue, uh, there are other um, res responses that, that PKA is involved in. Okay, so in this pathway, we see um, some examples of some of the features we talked about and all the general features, right? So amplification, we see this, okay? A few of these G-protein coupled receptors leads to the activation of a few uh, adenyl cyclase enzymes. Um, every active adenyl cyclase enzyme makes several cyclic AMP molecules, and then those cyclic AMP activate several PKA enzymes. And then this is where it really gets amplified, the PKA enzymes then have uh, a kinase cascade and in thousands of glycogen degrading enzymes uh, at least in liver tissue are activated and in the end tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of glucose molecules can be released into the bloodstream and it's probably easier to see this with a picture okay so we have one from one molecule of epinephrine binding to that receptor, right? That's going to activate um, the one receptor, right? That's one receptor that's being activated by one ligand. And then that can activate, you know, just on a, this is sort of a, an estimation, but uh, you could say maybe 10 of these G alpha subunits. 10 of those active G alpha subunits can then go on to activate adenyl cyclase uh, or 10 adenyl cyclase molecules. Uh, those will t could take um, and produce maybe 200 molecules of cyclic AMP. 200 molecules of cyclic AMP would activate 100 molecules of, of pKa. And we'll talk about why that is, that the number actually goes down there. Um, PKA, uh, 100 molecules of active PKA, then can go on to produce, um, you know, 1,000 molecules of, of another enzyme. And these, these, these enzymes here, you, you really don't need to know um, um, their names because we don't really, this is, I think, really the only place we see them. Um, so you, you have a, a tenfold increase here with this step, and then this is another kinase, so it's going to phosphorylate another enzyme, and you get another tenfold increase. So now we've, we've gone from 100 molecules of pKa in two steps. Now we're at 10,000 active molecules of this uh, glycogen uh, phosphorylase A. Uh, that then can break down glycogen into glucose. Um, glucose 1-phosphate specifically, and 
you have 10,000 molecules of that can liberate 100,000 molecules of, of glucose. Okay, so that, that would be the example of signal amplification in the beta-adrenergic pathway. Okay, another feature that we see is, is feedback. Okay, epinephrine is meant to be a short-acting signal. So the, or the, the cell needs to stop the, the, and I don't like this word here, synthesis. Um, it should, I think it should be um, glucose liberation or glucose release because it, it's, not, it's not technically synthesizing it. it. Glycogen is just a chain of, of glucose molecules. It's just cutting up glycogen into glucose. But, but just be aware of that. It's not actually synthesizing it. So the organism has to stop that, that, that production of glucose, that liberation of glucose, if there's no more need to, to either fight or flee. Okay. So downregulation of cyclic AMP occurs by the hydrolysis of GTP in the alpha subunit of the G protein it is one way that feeds back. Um, and we'll talk about another um, feedback uh, mechanism as well. Okay, so this is our pathway. We've, we've sort of gone through those first three steps, right? Um, you have your epinephrine binding that, that allows out the alpha subunit of the G protein to bind GTP and become active. You turn on adenylyl cyclase. Okay, so um, that's all well and good, but you don't want that to continue forever. So uh, one way that, that is stopped is that there's that intrinsic time limit in that alpha subunit. After, after so long, it, it just goes um, snip and it cuts that, that gamma phosphate off of the GTP uh, and, and it activates it. So that, that turns itself off. Okay, once that happens, it can then go back and associate with the, the beta and gamma subunits. Uh, there's also examples of integration here. Cyclic AMP is a very common secondary messenger. A large number of G protein coupled receptors mediate their effects via cyclic AMP. Um, they can both be activating and inhibiting um, uh, cyclic AMP synthesis. So you have some um, crosstalk there, right? Some, some of these these receptors activate cyclic AMP synthesis, you know, cause that concentration to go up. Others inhibit it and cause the concentration to go down. Uh, the human genome encodes about a thousand G uh, protein coupled receptors. Um, the ligands are things like hormones or growth factors, neurotransmitters, so, so many different types of, of ligands for these receptors. Right. There's also hundreds of different G protein coupled receptors that can be responsible for similar processes. Um, in the examples there, are things like taste and smell. And, and also, many of the ligands for these receptors have yet to be identified. You can go and do a, a sequence search of the genome, and you know very um, well these. Um, G protein receptors are seven transmembrane helices. So you can match up the sequence of a known G protein coupled receptor and sort of map that and search the genome and find other very similar genes that you know have to be t um, encoding other G protein coupled receptors. Um, so, and by doing that, you can see that there are, you know, about a thousand of them. Um, and only, I don't know the number exactly, but, um, you know, only a fraction of those that we, we know their, their receptor. There's some that we don't even know the receptor yet, the receptor molecule, um, ligand, I should say. Okay, so here is... Uh, table 12.2 and this shows some enzymes uh, or other proteins that are regulated by cyclic AMP dependent phosphorylation by that that PKA enzyme. Okay. 
Um, don't need to know these by heart um, or memorize them. It, it's just really here to emphasize the point that pKa is sort of promiscuous. It it will phosphorylate many different proteins. Most typically, it does it at the serine, the amino acid serine. But here's an, here's one example at least of a threonine that it phosphorylates. Okay. Um, the pathways that are involved in are, are shown here. Okay, so some of these, um, some of these enzymes that PKA phosphorylates will be um, more uh, or less expressed in, in you know depending on what tissue you're in, um, and so then the the end response will be slightly different in, in in different tissues okay and there's also you know if if many if you know quite a few of these are expressed in a single cell there's going to be some crosstalk here right uh if if pk pka is phosphorylating all of these right the the um the pathway that uh, or response that gets um turned on there's going to be some sort of interplay here because they're these are all involved in, in different responses okay. some signals that use cyclic amp as a secondary messenger right they're shown here um right we've seen the epinephrine um would be the the signal ex the example that we showed um others uh, maybe pick out some that might be important. Um, glucagon, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, next time. It, it, it's um, interplay with insulin. Um, histamine, uh, having, you know, allergic responses um, involve histamine. Uh, what are some other good ones? Serotonin, um, the neurotransmitter. Um, if, and even like thyroid hormone, thyroid stimulating hor hormone TSH. Um, so you know there's there's many many different pathways, signal um, signaling pathways that use cyclic AMP. And this probably this list probably would be a, the better example of crosstalk because you know these pathways are going to um, have in so, in some cases some of these pathways are going to have you know, opposite of physiological effects on a cell. Okay. Cyclic AMP is able to mediate multiple signals because of its location uh, of, um, excuse me, the localization of protein kinase A. So protein kinase A, it, it, it's not really just floating around randomly. It, it is in close proximity um, with the adenylocyclase and a beta adrenergic receptor via these protein complexes. And this is really more complicated than we need to get in this class, but you can you can think of it as um, PKA is, is very, very close proximity to adenylocyclase. And, and that's why um, Right, we typically th um, in in the other figures we showed adenylocyclase making cyclic AMP, and then that goes off and finds PKA s somewhere. But it, in reality, it's very close to adenylocyclase. So as soon as cyclic AMP is made, it can go and and activate PKA. Okay, so how is that activated? Well, it turns out that that PKA is a tetramer and it's um, actually uh, the tetramer is a dimer uh, of um, uh, two heterodimers it's a, a dimer of a dimer um, which makes up four okay so if you just focus on one part of this tetramer so just take this top half this is pka protein kinase A. 
Okay, it has one dimer, the top dimer has an, an R subunit and a C subunit. Okay, the R stands for a receptor subunit and the C stands for a catalytic subunit. Okay. So there's one of those on top, one of those on bottom. Right. It turns out that you need two cyclic AMPs to bind to one of the receptor regions to release the catalytic site in, in when that catalytic site subunit is released the catalytic site is exposed and it becomes active okay so in this case for the tetramer because there's two r sites you're going to need four cyclic amps okay so four cyclic amps would then go on to release two uh, active pka catalytic sites okay that is the reason when we are talking about this the signal amplification that step where between cyclic AMP and PKA we actually lost um, went down by a factor of two that's why because we need two cyclic AMPs to activate one PKA right. once those PKAs are active what they do is they take uh, ATP and they stick it on different proteins. They phosphorylate, um, they take a phosphate from ATP and stick it on, um, remember most commonly it's serine, but, but sometimes it can be threonine. Uh, they phosphorylate proteins at, at those amino acids. Okay. Okay, it turns out that one of the proteins PKA phosphorylates is phosphodiesterase, PDE. Phosphodiesterase, if you also remember, that is the enzyme that, that cuts the cyclic AMP and converts it back into a AMP, just normal AMP, They're, thereby inactivating the cyclic AMP. So if you, know, if you have these, these PKA molecules, they're, they're active, you have enough of them around, uh, eventually they're going to go and they find PDE, and they phosphorylate it, which activates it, then PDE can, can cut some cyclic AMP and in, in, in a sense, get rid of the cyclic AMP, lower that cyclic AMP concentration, and thereby inactivate PKA. So this is a, a great example of feedback. Uh, the feedback inhibition that will, will actually turn off this response in the, the beta adrenergic receptor pathway and really any pathway that involves cyclic AMP. Okay. Uh, some bacteriotoxins are enzymes that target G proteins and examples uh, are from cholera and uh, whooping cough toxins um, respond in uh, this way they they um, really what happens is they modify the the G protein the alpha subunit of the G protein in such a way that it it it, it always activates the adenylocyclase and then adenylocyclase is always on and you're going to be producing too much cyclic AMP from ATP okay and that you know, uses up ATP, which isn't good. And then it also, you have a lot of cyclic AMP floating around, which then um, causes a lot of different physiological responses that don't, don't necessarily need to be happening at that time. Okay. Uh, these uh, G protein coupled receptors can also use other secondary messenger molecules uh, and an example here is what's known as inositol 145 triphosphate. Um, we did, I think we saw a, this was one of the lipids we talked about, um, head groups. Uh, you can also just think of this as IP3 or simply inositol, I think would be fine. Um, it's, it's typically in the form of phosphatidyl inositol 3-phosphate and, and it would be 
in the membrane. The, the head group is that inositol, 3-phosphate. Okay, when the G protein, when a hormone binds in this receptor, turns that G protein on, um, that G protein then activates what's known and is uh, phospholipase C. That cuts that head group off of that um, phosphatidyl inositol, and then that uh, inositol 3-phosphate will then go and, and bind to a, a ligand-gated ion channel which then lets calcium uh, into uh, the cell. Then calcium um, uh, binds to, to protein kinase C, and, and it, it activates it um, for further um, response. This pathway, you don't need to know the specifics of this pathway, um, just that there's other molecules other than cyclic AMP that, that can be used as secondary messengers. Okay. All right, so we're going to move on to our second, second example that we'll see in some detail of, of a, a G protein coupled receptor. Okay, and that is in site. And, and in site, we have um, rods and cone cells that then transduce. Um, I don't like this. I, I really feel like the light should be coming in this way and hitting the rods and cones. Um, and then that elicits a response from uh, into your um, neurons and into the nerve cells, which then goes to the brain and, and, and depicts that, that sight, the, the light hitting the rods and cones as an image. Right, so what happens uh, in here, um, this is really a sort of a, an FYI, but what we have is that um, we have a molecule called cyclic GMP, right? very similar to, uh, to cyclic AMP, but we have a um, different, different base on that, that nucleotide. Right? We have a G instead of an A. That is a ligand for an ion, a ligand-gated ion channel. And when that is bound, the ligand, the, excuse me, the ion channel is open. Okay. When the ion channel is open, what we have is uh, influx of, of calcium and sodium into the, the rod. Um, and then we have also this, this sodium pump um, pumping sodium molecules out, right? So you're, you're actively pumping sodium molecules out so that you can use this SIM port, um, this ligand-gated ion channel acts as a SIM port. You, the sodium will move down uh, its concentration gradient and bring a calcium against its concentration gradient, okay? So this would be an example of secondary active transport. Okay. So that is producing a you know a particular membrane potential shown here. Okay, when light hits this cell, this rod cell, what happens is the the cyclic GMP is not bound to that ion channel. Then it's closed. You don't get influx of of sodium or calcium in, right? You're you're getting a um, uh, sodium out. Right, and, and then the, the membrane potential uh, is, becomes lower, and then that, that lower membrane potential um, is, is causing a electrical signal, which is then transported to the, the next neuron, uh, and then finally through you know, nerve um, nerve cells all the way into the, the brain. Okay. The G protein coupled receptor involved in this pathway is known as rhodopsin. Okay, and rhodopsin is shown here in red with the seven transmembrane helices. It's a little bit different because its ligand is, um, is sort of already bound there in that receptor okay it's not um, 
and this is a receptor for light, right? So it, what it, it has its ligand per kind of, I don't want to say permanently bound because I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure if it can come out and go back in, but f we can think of it as being permanently bound in there. Okay. And then when the light hits that, the, the ligand, that ligand changes shape. And then that, that, that transduces the signal to the G protein. The G protein in this particular example is known as transducin. Okay, so this is um, uh, the G protein involved in sight. And again, it's a, a stimulatory G protein. So we, we refer to it as G sub S. And here's a better, like uh, a little bit better picture, I think, of these G proteins have a little anchor here, uh, in this case, isoprene groups that keep them associated with the membrane. All right, this is our pathway uh, for, for our, we can just call this a site pathway or uh, the rhodopsin pathway. Um, it's shown here, there are two different parts to it. Okay, one is the excitation part, that is, you know, the light hitting rhodopsin and then uh, the G protein being activated and, and what happens um, through that pathway, through that signal transduction that ultimately leads to um, the cyclic GMP concentration to be lowered. Okay, that's all the excitatory phase. Um, there's also the other part of that, right? Once, once that happens um, and you, you send a signal, you have to be able to recover from that um, and, and get back to your starting point so it can then sense another um, um, photon of light. Okay. In this class, you only need to really focus on the, the excitation phase. Okay, we, we're not going to focus on the recovery phase. If, you, if you're curious about this, um, like you think this is going to be on the MCAT or uh, something, or you're just interested in it, um, by all means, um, feel free to, to you know, study that part. But just to simplify things a bit, we're going to focus only on the, the excitation phase. So on an exam, I'm not going to ask any questions about the, the recovery phase. Okay. Good. So looking at this in a little bit more detail, the first thing that happens is light is is going to hit this rhodopsin molecule. And when that happens, uh, uh, visible light, it's going to change that that ligand that's in there. And it's if you remember, we, we've talked about this before, it's 11 cis retinal is that that ligand that's in there. When light hits it, it becomes uh, all trans or trans retinal. Okay, and that change in conformation of the ligand then changes the structure slightly of that 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 receptor, and that's conduced into a structural change into transducin in the alpha subunit. GTP can then bind, which activates um, tra alpha, transducin alpha. Okay which is again, the G protein that then goes and activates the enzyme PDE, right? Phosphodiesterase. And we've seen that, um, and how it activates it is kind of a little bit unique. Phosphodiesterase has an inhibitor bound to it, an inhibitory subunit. And what transducin does is it takes that inhibitory subunit away. So that inhibitory subunit on PDE then binds to transducin alpha and PDE becomes active, okay? And this PDE, and you can think of um, this, this PDE, it's, it's, it's gonna do the same thing as it, it did to cyclic AMP, uh, Remember, we talked about PDE, once it's activated, um, 
by protein kinase A, uh, it it um, it it starts to cut uh, cyclic AMP and it makes um, AMP, right? So that this is a different PDE, and this PDE is, spe is specific for cyclic GMP, but it does the same thing. It takes cyclic GMP and it converts it into five prime GMP. So it cuts the and breaks the ring in the cyclic GMP. Okay, so when it so it, as it's active, it'll it'll do that, and eventually it lowers that concentration of cyclic GMP. When that concentration is low enough, right, that the the cyclic GMP is not going to be in that that ligand gated receptor and those are going to close okay. and those closing means that you're not going to get the the calcium um, in there and the membrane potential is going to be um, what's known as hyperpolarized okay and then that then the the polarization the hyperpolarization of that membrane is what then sends a signal to the next um, the neuron and then that is that signal is then propagated uh, all the way to the brain okay. and again that that process of sending the next uh, the signal to the next cell um, those those can be you know very complex processes so as far as we're concerned with with sight this is sort of what you need to know about it as far as the signaling pathway. Okay. Um, other uh, sensory percep uh, perception is mediated by these, these um, G protein coupled receptors. Um, uh, vasopressin, this is um, a, a hormone or, or signaling molecule that really has the opposite effect of epinephrine. Okay, so th these two would be examples of uh, uh, things that are acting on the same um, uh, sort of physiological responses, but in opposite ways. Okay, their vasopressin actually has a, a G protein um, with the sub I. So that's, that's an example here of an inhibitory G protein. So when vasopressin binds to its receptor, the, the an inhibitory G alpha subunit um, is then liberated and it goes and turns off adenylocyclase. Okay, and what that does is it lowers the concentration of cyclic AMP and it inactivates, um, in a sense, PKA. Okay, right? Epinephrine does the opposite. So these two, vasopressin and epinephrine, um, if you have both of those uh, signaling molecules around at the same time, you're going to get it. That would be an example of, of crosstalk or, or integration, right? The net effect will be, you know, the interplay between those two, right? We've, we've talked about this light. Um, obviously, that's uh, sensory. Uh, odorants are also using uh, G protein coupled receptors. And, and so they can do that either in that very quick example we saw of of using a um, uh, lipase um, that releases the inositol, which then binds to a, a, li a, a ligand gated ion channel. They can, can use that, or they can also use cyclic AMP um, to do the same same thing uh, with an ion channel. And then taste uh, also can use G protein coupled receptors. Okay, you have um, another interplay with with the adenylocyclase and cyclic AMP, uh, controlling a um, ligand channel that's controlled by uh, being phosphorylated. Okay, so you see that there's you know many of these pathways are using. Um, at least three of these that are shown use cyclic AMP. So really, it, the, the overall physiological response is going to be 
um, dependent on the tissue type because you know some tissues might have you know in your tongue right you're going to have more of these um, receptors for 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 taste molecules or in your nose you'd have um, receptors for odorants and you might not have um, as many receptors right you definitely were not going to have a, a rhodopsin receptor in, in in your nose right so the the interplay um, becomes more tissue specific based on what proteins are expressed in that specific tissue and, and what proteins need to be expressed to give you the, the, the specific physiological responses you need. Okay, so that that is all we have um, on G protein coupled receptors. Next time we're going to talk about um, gated ion channels, which comes from section six, receptor tyrosine kinases, which comes from section three, and then a little bit about cell cycle regulation, uh, and that's uh, section 11. And we talk about that because that is sort of a more of a specific example of, of um, receptor tyrosine kinases.